So um, I think Phil is more or less going to run the meeting because Dan wasn't able to make it and the person from his um, firm that he thought could come also can't make it. So we're going to we're going to muddle through and um, it's our first meeting. Welcome, everyone. So I guess I'll do the welcomes, Phil, because um, I said you're going to run it and off I go. Um, so we'll do the we'll do the welcomes and introductions. Um, and then I will just maybe just um, quickly run through the agenda and then I'll hand it over to Phil. And I'll, and I'll I guess we'll co-run it, Phil. So, um, okay, so here we go. So um, I think everyone knows me, Candace, the director of the Tilton Library. Uh, Satu? Hi, nice to see everyone. I'm Satu Zoller, I'm chair of the trustees. And as Candace mentioned earlier, was part of the original building committee many moons ago, along with Judith and Candace and several others. <laughs> Uh, let's see, Judy. Yes, hi, I'm Judy. I'm uh, with the Friends of Tilton Library, who I've worked with for many years, and I was part of the original committee. Um, and really glad to be here. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Phil. My name is Phil O'Brien with Johnson Roberts Associates. Um, I'm a principal at Johnson Roberts, and um, we're going to be the lead on the design team. Excellent. Julie. I'm Julie Chalpont. I'm the um, chair of the finance committee. And I'm, I'm probably going to be on this committee, but I'm going to throw it out to the finance committee to see if there's another member on the finance committee who might want to join us instead. So okay. we'll see. All right, great. Well, we're thrilled to have you for now or, or forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, Vern. Hi, I'm Vern Harrington and builder long time in the town and currently Greenfield Building Inspector. Oh, fun job. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Tim. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm Tim Hilchy. I'm a newest member of the DFL Select Board and uh, happy to be among you. Great. And I think we're missing, are we missing Ava or? We're missing Ava. Um, so yeah, so Dan's not here and Ava, I didn't hear from her. And um, so maybe she'll be joining, maybe she's held up somewhere. Um, she does have a pretty highfalutin job with the um, DEP. So who knows? Um, all right, so here's just the agenda. We open the meeting, which is recording. We um, did introductions. The next thing we'll be doing is vote for a chairperson, vice chair and clerk. Uh, we're going to talk about the schedule of the project. We're going to talk about the temporary library space and putting in a, a request for proposals together for that. Um, contract updates for the project manager and the designer. We will go through the invoice process discussion and then we'll schedule the next meeting and then adjourn. So I guess we'll start with voting the chairperson, vice chair and clerk. Phil, do you feel comfortable leading that that part? Oh, um, well, I'm not sure that I am the best one to lead <laughs> that, but I can certainly tell you what um, what I've kind of run into in in the in the past. Um, obviously, it, as as the chair, um, I think you'd be looking for somebody who uh, is pretty confident they could make it to the majority of the meetings, if not you're talking about electing a vice chair and um, or a co co chair I guess another thing is that I've seen before but I think vice chair makes sense for you um, and that person should be able to um, keep everybody on track so you need to be a little bit ruthless uh, in some cases in order to kind of uh, keep things uh, uh, on on the agenda and on topic and um, and from my point of view, and perhaps from Dan's point of view, I don't really know, um, revisiting things that we've already covered and have voted on and moved past um, can be a real um, strain on maintaining your schedule. And so I, I think that your chair probably ought to be somebody that's a kind of a taskmaster that will, that will kind of keep things moving forward. Okay. Rather than revisiting things. That's my best advice for a chairperson. Uh, you all know each other a lot better than I know you all, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it just, to you. Yeah, and so the other positions, Candace, were vice chair and clerk, you said? 
Yes. The vice chair basically is a sub if the chair can't make it. And then the clerk is someone who's just going to mostly keep minutes. And yeah. OK. The other thing I've seen is folks passing the baton week to week when it comes to minutes. Um, Oh, that's a nice idea based too. Based on what I've heard, everybody hates to do it. Um, <laughs> uh, Dan's not here, so I can't tell you whether or not it's something that he normally does. Um, I don't recall that as being one of the things that he that he has done on other projects that I've worked on. Okay. But occasionally, an, an OPM will say, "Yeah, we'll take on that task." And again, I don't want to volunteer Dan for that task. Um, it's <laughs> In, in a lot of ways, it's probably best for you to keep your own meeting minutes. Um, yeah. That way. Well, I think it's probably just better for you all to keep your own meeting minutes uh, yeah. because I'll have notes that I take myself and Dan will as well. And it's nice to, I think, to have a couple of different ways you can check some things. Um, okay. By, by checking in with us, we can go back through our handwritten notes. Great. All right, so I guess um, we will see who would like to be, ask for people to volunteer to be a chairperson. Do I have any volunteers? It can't be me. <laughs> Cricket. Why can't it be you? <laughs> what? It can't be you, Candace, for some reason? I don't think so. Because I'm ex, ex officio. Oh, you don't live in town, is that right? No, I, I do. But um well, you're ex officio member of the committee. I don't think you are ex officio. I think you actually are a member of the committee. Oh, okay. Yeah. Unless you might have put committee. that Oh, you, you might have put it yourself, yeah. You might have listed yourself that way when you put your paper forward. Um, but maybe we can check on that. Okay. Well, I would prefer it not to be me just because of all the other tasks I have to do with the project. Um, in, in absence of a volunteer, you could certainly, someone could nominate someone. Well, if I don't have to be a clerk, <laughs> uh, because I, I, I think um, that both Phil and Dan should be providing weekly or meeting wise yeah. summaries of everything they've contributed, which is the OPM and the designer driving that part of the process. Um, that will help a lot with what we actually did. Um, but I'd be happy to do the vice chair because I can be tough if uh, I need to be to keep us focused. So not the chair chair? No. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, tattoos in the middle of my screen. <laughs> no, I was actually just going to say I'm going to be in Finland for much of March. Um, but if someone would be willing to like co-chair with me or something like that, like Judy, I don't know. <laughs> well, I think the co-chair would be the vice chair, right? Same thing. Is that how it would work? And I defer yeah. to Judy. I'm fine with that. <laughs> Unless yeah, you're not I, interested. Uh, I, 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 I can't take on being chair. Um, yeah. uh, it's just, it's not in my wheelhouse right now. Um, but I could fill in, um, you know, I'm really good with specific, uh, well-defined tasks, um, uh, but sort of large stuff. Um, I, I can't take that on now. Okay. Okay. I mean, while I'm away, I'm hoping to still come to meetings and things like that, but there will be, I'm sure a couple of times that I can't, sure. um, so well, as long as I have offering to be the chair, that's great. And maybe Tim, do you mind filling in as the vice chair in March? No. Or I'll give you the specific dates. Yeah. Okay. Once we know our schedule. Yeah. And I know, and I, I know that because Satu is a chair of the trustees, that she's very good at that role with keeping things on task. <laughs> and Tim, you've already said I don't like wasting know. time. So <laughs> <laughs> that's great. All right. And do you guys want to have, a, does anyone want to be a clerk? I'll ask that first. <laughs> Because if nobody wants to, we can do the rotation that Phil was talking about. Mm -hmm -hmm. So I guess. Well, who's not here? Yeah. <laughs> I will nominate them. That's what often happens. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm just kidding. No. Oh, I could. I we could ask. I could ask her when I talk to her next if she doesn't come to the meeting. Um, but maybe for now, we could rotate. 
And since, uh, and I, I'll take the notes for the first one just to give people a break. All right, so I'm gonna say clerk is rotating for now. The, the, the one thing about, about taking minutes is that um, you, you really just need to record decisions that get made. You don't need to go into gr gross detail about every discussion and who said what and who said that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really very, very simple. And very true. my recollection actually is that Dan did do the minutes um, before we were had the, this going before. And his minutes were like the shortest minutes I've ever seen. Um, but, you know, it, it just was just a record of we made this decision and that's that. I agree. You just work from the agenda and then add any, yep, right. any decisions. Yep. Okay. Okay. So it looks like we've accomplished that. Thanks to everyone. Thank you to you and, and um, Tim. Um, if you think you know which way you want to go, I would suggest that somebody make a motion that it be seconded and then you vote it so that you can record that vote. Okay, so that would, I'm not sure who's running the meeting today. Is that, is it me? It must be me. Okay. Well, I'd make um, a motion that, to appoint Satu as uh, the chair and uh, we'll do these one at a time. I'll second. second. I can, oh, can I second myself? I can't. <laughs> I'll a, second that. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Congratulations. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I, <laughs> it was, I, a, it was a hard it. fought election, but <laughs> I move that Tim be designated as the vice chair. Second. All those in favor? <laughs> who, who is the second? I'm sorry. That's unanimous. Julie, Julie again. <laughs> Our official seconder. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then um I guess I'm a, I guess I'm part of the committee, so I can make a motion. Uh, I'll make a motion that um, going forward that we will have the, the clerk taking minutes uh, rotate for each meeting. Well, I thought we were going to talk to Dan first and see if he'll do it. Oh, okay. I just I think I'd rather have more, a little more detail for um, if he takes really really short minutes. I think I'd rather have a little more detail. So. Maybe I'll talk to him. Mm -hmm. How does that sound? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So no motion needed at this point, I guess. You can tell I've never run a meeting before. Yeah, you you, you moved it, and it sounds like it's just going to get tabled for. Let's table that. Yeah. <laughs> I moved to table that motion. <laughs> okay. Does Zoom have a transcript? Uh... <laughs> It does. So oh, that's interesting. If we had a transcript pod, that could be very detailed. There we uh, go. So let's think about that. And we are recording meetings. If you ever want to go back and check something um, as well. Sure, but I, I, I've got one group that said, oh, we're recording these things, so we don't need to take minutes. And oh, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> no, that does not work because looking back through three or four sets of minutes is not the same as sit through six or seven hours of meetings. Oh, God, no. <laughs> Yeah, I guess um, I, I've been hearing from um, directors who've gone through this process in recent years, and they said that minutes really helped them in case things um, for the cracks, details to look at, to have minutes to look back on. So that's why I was told it was important. So, um, okay. I guess we'll go on the, well, the next subject is on the agenda is project schedule discussion. So I guess, uh, Phil, you can take that one. I'm gonna share my screen if that is allowed here. Yep. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is a, this is a draft. Um, I, I discussed this kind of briefly with, with Dan. Dan's um, kind of initial feedback was, can you do it quicker? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, we're looking at starting schematic design, basically uh, assuming I, I've just updated this today. The, the, okay. When I originally put it together and talked to Dan about it, it was the second or third week in December. Um, but I've updated it today and it basically I'm assuming that we're going to kick this thing off uh, today and that we'll start working on schematic design. And, I, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but we're looking at... Um, 
the schematic design revisions would typically uh, at a stage like this be a little shorter. Um, I've got two months in here. Um, and the reason is because we've been talking about rather than just kind of picking up where we left off with the grant and moving some things around a little bit, we've talked about potentially rearranging the building completely um, because it's, we're trying to save um, there's two trees in the back and, and, and right now the plan calls for taking one of those down and we've been asked at, at least a couple of times now if there's a way to, that we could keep both of those trees. Um, and so this that time period assumes that we're going to need to dig a little deeper into the schematic design and 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 change some things in order to accommodate that. Um, design development. Um, that's when um, the work of all of our engineers begins to really ramp up uh, in schematic design. The engineers um, in, input is going to be a little bit more limited. They'll be they're there for answering mm -hmm. questions and and. Um, you know they, they want to get paid but um but everybody does um and it's really just advice and there's sometimes line diagrams and uh feedback on on the allowances that we need to make and the sizes of things that we need to assume and so forth um design development is really when they kind of jump in and we really develop the design in in more detail and we get um feedback from all of them on um on the sizes of all those things that they're going to need, you know, is is the is the mechanical room and the electrical room that we've shown in the plan is that big enough to be able to accommodate everything they need? Do they need an elect an electrical closet on the second floor somewhere where we're not showing one right now? Or, um, how how big is the structure going to be so that we can help to set the ceiling heights, which have an impact on how tall the windows can be? All that stuff. Those are the things that we've kind of made assumptions on in during uh, the earlier schematic design. Um, and we've we've done a number of buildings, so we're pretty confident most of it's going to work, but some things always change around a little bit during that design development. We'll decide then on what kind of a heating system we're going to have and that kind of thing. They'll be making presentations to you all doing comparisons and so forth. And so we got about three months and we really can't do it much quicker than that. Um, Construction drawings is the one that um, we've got well, four and a half, five months in here. Dan was asking if we could squeeze a little bit more time out of that. Uh, once we get a little bit further into the design development and the consultants have a better idea about the overall scope of the work, I can get together with them at that point and ask if there's a way that we could cut some time out of this schedule to bring that, that date back. We're looking at basically um, going out to bid in, in November. Um, and, and bidding, public bidding takes about two months or so. Um, and so you'd have the bids in hand next uh, January. And then they'd, uh, they'd start with construction. Uh, at some point in here, this is really just a rough schedule. Um, it really just is just blocks of time at this point. And there'll be a lot more detail that Dan will have. But this is, I just kind of put this together so I can get my head around it so I'd be able to speak to you about it. Um, and we're looking at about a, a year to build it, roughly. Um, that's that's based on substantial completion. Once you're substantially complete, then there's some punch list stuff with little things that they need to kind of wrap up and so forth. And this is in January. And if they actually do try to finish in January, they, they oftentimes will have to come back and do a little planting or something in the spring. So. That number is kind of rough. I think Dan might have figured in about 14 months. That probably is the total, which includes the substantial completion plus the close out at the end. Um, so these these later dates down in here could are, are a little bit more in flux, but it gives you an idea of though, kind of what we're talking about. I would expect that we'd probably want to meet every two or three weeks during schematic design revisions and in DD, and then we could from construction drawing is down through construction, we could probably meet about once per month just for invoices and things like that. Just to give you an idea about the kind of mm -hmm. the heavy lift uh, is really in the in the beginning in terms of the meetings that you all will need to attend. And by the time we get down into winter or the end of winter, the be spring in 2025, you'll be you'll be glad to see Dan and I leave. <laughs> And you can move into your new building. <laughs> but that's kind of what it looks like at this point. Dan, I think what Dan was wondering is if there was a way that we could get this thing out to bid and then have the bids in hand in enough time 
that you could do the demolition work and get the foundations into the ground before the cold weather starts at the end of this year. Right. Uh, that, that you'd really need to take about three months off this schedule in order to be able to do that. So I right. might trim a month or so out of here, but I'm not sure I could get it back that far. But then again, if it's like this year, uh, you know, there's no real problem because we're yeah. not having winter till February or March. Uh, yeah, yeah. If we have a winter like this, then you're then you're probably right. If if, if it wouldn't be so bad, um, you know, we hate we hate to wish for global warming, but <laughs> it has been kind of like that. Um, <clears throat> Phil, Phil, where does the um, process of dealing with the town, with the planning board, and all the various and sundry permitting stuff that has to happen, where where does where does that hap fit into the schedule? So, as as I mentioned earlier, Judy, that we're really just kind of blocking this out at this point. Um, but if um, you get down in here into the construction documents phase. And about three quarters of the way through the construction documents, somewhere in there, we'd probably be doing a cost estimate. So we're going to stop what we're doing. Everybody will make PDFs of where they are. We'll have drawings and specifications, and that we'll do our last cost estimate at that point. Um, typically, um, planning boards and and folks like building inspectors, fire departments, um, aren't really interested in looking at plans that are that are really incomplete because. Um, their, their job is kind of uh, crossing the T's and dotting the I's. And at 75% complete, um, there's still 25% uh, T crosses and I dots missing. Um, so it's hard to get, uh, it's, it's, it's hard much before that, it's hard to get to the planning board or somebody else like that to look at a set of documents because they're, they're kind of incomplete. So typically what we'll end up doing is somewhere between 75 and 85 or 90 percent documents or so um, we'll ask the civil engineers and this landscape architects to finish ahead of time because they really when when you submit for for planning board application typically the rules are 100 percent working drawings complete so you don't really want to wait until you're out here and bidding because by the time bidding is over and you're ready to build the building you might not have permits in your hand so we really need to get those guys to finish up ahead of time so it'll be Based on this schedule, it'll be somewhere September, October, where we'd probably be talking about trying to get on their agenda. So we'll be submitting somewhere back in here. And then if there's additional. When we did the DPW done. building here in yep. town, we met with the building inspector a little bit early also, so that we had his buy in and he was well aware of what we were up, up to. And that worked very well. Oh, good, good. So I thought you were a building. Are you a building inspector in another town? Correct, in Greenfield. Ah, oh, okay, okay. So you're you're mining the store over at our Greenfield Library then. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> I'm going to be careful what I say, Vern. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So uh, does that answer your question, Judy? Yes, thank you. Yeah, once we get a little closer to that point, I'm sure we'll 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 get into talking to it a little bit more, and the civil engineer will start to do things like reach out directly to those um, approving boards and committees and begin to set some schedule some times with them. I have a question, Phil. Um, at what point during the process do we get um, public uh, feedback, like have a public forum on the design? I I, I would say that um, if we if we weren't kind of take the schematic design apart and kind of redesign the addition. I'd say you could do that pretty quickly, but I think you probably want to, I think the best thing to do is to have a pretty good idea what direction you want to head in. Yeah. Um, and, and then present that to folks um, and look for their feedback. Um, so that would be before design development? Yeah, toward the end of schematic design, you have a plan and we can kind of um, present that to the public, get the feedback, and then any of those changes that we do can be rolled right into design development. Um, and in other words, the beginning of design development is still one of, it's still a design phase. So we can still move some things around a little bit. The further we get down into design development, and then once we get into working drawings, it gets a little harder to move things around. Okay. Um, for example, in schematic design, moving a, moving a wall five feet or moving a door five feet, no big deal. The impact is on our drawings. Um, once we 
once we have the engineers and they've done their lighting and they've put the switches on the wall and they've put a thermostat and we move a door and move a wall, there's a thousand different other things that need to move as well. Um, and it just gets harder and harder. It, it's not impossible, it just gets harder to do. Uh, and so we'll, we'll kind of remind you as we move forward that we need buy-in on okay. XYZ so that we can kind of keep things moving forward. But there's still opportunities to move things around. And at the end of the day, if it absolutely does not work to have the door swinging this way, it has to swing that way, we'll change it. Um, and occasionally things like that happen and that's fine. We'll, we'll always be able to accommodate small things. Okay. Uh, bigger things are just gonna be a little bit more of a, of a task. And we may, and we may say, uh, sure, we could do that, but it may add two weeks to the schedule. You know, if we're 90% working drawings and you wanted to move a wall, it's, it might take a couple of weeks. Whereas okay. moving a wall now, it would take me 10 minutes. Right. And what about staff, staff input? Sorry. No, go ahead, Candace. Uh, what about the input of staff? Like I know the children's librarian is very curious about having input to the um, children's room and then the teen, same for the teen librarian. At what point would you want there? Sure, I, I think that, that I probably ought to happen in stages. There's a, there's a couple of different points during the design where I think that that makes sense and we should schedule times to do that when it comes to things like um, when we get a little further into design development or even the beginning of working drawings, we'll get into things like figuring out what all the casework looks like, where all the cabinets, right. drawers and doors are in each of the different rooms. And we're gonna to wanna to talk to folks about how they expect to use those spaces. And, um, and so initially in schematic design, we may be showing cabinets on the walls, for example, in the program room or in your kitchenette. Um, they're really just a stand-in at this point. And I, I, we don't really need to know uh, whether or not, hey, you know, we should take out those two cabinets and, and put in a microwave shelf. That isn't something um, you could certainly volunteer that information. It, it can't hurt, but we'll kind of reach out to you at certain points during that to make sure that we're kind of on track with, with those folks. I'd say if, if you're thinking about reaching out to the public and showing them where we're at, I would think about maybe meeting with the staff and kind of going through the design prior to that. Okay. Um, so we can get their input in that way when we're meeting with the public and somebody makes a suggestion, hey, how about we do this? Then we'll have the feedback and we'll be able to answer those questions based on what we've learned from you all and also what we've learned from the staff. Okay, great, thank you. We like to be able to say, we've done it like this and this is the reason why. Right. Okay, great. Tim? <laughs> So Phil, I have a cup, uh, a list of questions, and I, if they're not appropriate for this, just say so. Sure. Um, we are currently, um, our town campus group is currently uh, moved forward into a geothermal uh, application that we're supposed to learn about uh, whether we've been granted the engineering phase of this project in March, um, and then there would be a month or two of, hopefully, just a month of negotiating um contract and uh, if that happens when does when do you know when do you need to know in this uh, design process whether you're going to be hooking into a geothermal exchange field and um or or not um th that's a good question um the best time would be during design development um there's a certain amount that the engineers can do um because as you probably know, heating and cooling systems have kind of an interior element and an exterior element. Um, and they could work a little ways on the interior portions of that, assuming that they're gonna find some heat sink outside, whether it's to the air or to the ground or whatever. Um, but then eventually they're gonna kind of run out of ways to keep moving forward. Um, that's probably in the beginnings of the construction documents phase. Um, they will come during design development, probably a third of the way or so through design development. They'll do some engineering. They'll compare a number of different systems. Then they'll come to make some recommendations to you. That'll, that'll include some preliminary energy modeling. Um, and then they'll give you some life cycle costs. And then they'll make some recommendations based on all that. Uh, that would be a great time to ask them what they thought about that. We did something similar on another project with the same engineer where they were thinking about doing geothermal versus not doing geothermal. 
um, and we were able to kind of move that along. Uh, they may bring that up as an example that that process took longer than it should have and uh, and ended up becoming a problem with, with getting things done on time. So uh, we if that's the way you want to go, we will we'll work with you on that. Um, and as those dates are coming up, we'll continue to remind you if this um, and, and, and if, if that's the way it's going to go, if people are happy with it and it just hasn't been completely designed yet but you all tell us this is what's going to happen. We'll just assume that that's what's going to happen and that, and we'll provide the, the, you know, the engineers will provide the loads that need to be fulfilled as part of that field. And we'll just assume that it's going to be up and running. And um, this is a question about LED, the lead certification. Yep. Um, Dan Pilata seemed to imply that, um, this is the lowest level of lead certification that we're looking at and um, that probably by designing the building most of the most of the things that you would need to do to get lead certification would be taking place anyway is that a correct assessment um let me see if i can parse that a little bit uh, is the question do you really need to be lead certified in order to be energy efficient i guess the question is do we do you have to when you design a lead certified building even if it's the lowest level of lead certification does it add huge amounts of money to the project or oh, no no because if we're only going to get a hundred thousand dollars back off the price tag and it's going to cost us seven hundred thousand to get there that's a thing we need to consider sure i mean i'm okay. in favor of lead certification but i just want to understand sure that is that's a that's a good question. Now, if you ask the MBLC, they will they will tell you that the additional grant money that they're offering for you to get lead certified will help help you to pay the design costs and the fees associated with getting certified. It's not designed to help you pay the additional construction costs to pay to add those things into your building. They, so it's not hundred thousand dollars versus seven hundred thousand but it's probably a hundred thousand dollars worth against maybe two or three hundred thousand something like that between the fees that you'll spend um and the additional construction cost it used to be when it first came out we used to be we used to tell folks just getting certified will cost you an extra five percent construction cost the whole idea of the of the the lead certification program was to take some of these strategies and technologies that were a little bit on the fringe and bring them a little bit more into the mainstream. And they've been very successful with that. And so a lot of things that they have suggested that were a little bit on the on the fringe uh, when when they started the program have become more of the norm. And you know, we've got a new stretch code now. And um, when Dan says, just meeting the stretch code and the energy code is is going to get you most of the way there. It will in terms of the efficiency, but it doesn't really get you all there as far as lead certification. There's a lot of other busy work that you have to do in order to get lead certified. A lot of it's a lot of paperwork that's kind of associated with it, which is where the kind of the fees come from. It's not so much the design of the mechanical and electrical systems. It's like it's the clean air stuff and you know getting all making sure that every paint and adhesive that's used in the building is low VOC and then we need we need that written down and and so that we can upload all that stuff it's you know there's a lot of that stuff so written down and verified yes chain of custody like, all kinds of goodness right right it's just it's kind of it's kind of a pain so it the hundred grand or so that you may get is to help pay the fees to do that stuff but in it may go a little bit of it may go towards the construction cost, but you'll pay a little bit more. But you know, the hope is is that if um, you're going to have a, a healthy building and it's going to be a lower operating cost to be really energy efficient. You, you know, they got they got one temporary heater over in Greenfield, um, and they run that thing for an hour or so in the morning, and then that's it. It's the place stays warm all day. They they don't have they're not running the permanent heating system in there. They just got a little one heater it heats the whole building. And when do you need input or when will you bring us, you know, assuming that we're moving this yeah. to the side, 
um, and Dan suggested in our annual our special town meeting that we were going to definitely incorporate solar panels onto the roof because it's south facing. Mm -hmm. At what point will you have some preliminary ideas to share with us? I that'll mean, that'll we're not be wait till right 60 in. days in order to say we like this, we don't like this, right? Sure. We'll we'll kind of roll that right in with the with the design development. So when when the engineers come to make their presentations uh, and talk about life cycle costs and so forth, they'll talk to you about those options and photovoltaics and 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 what they might be worth. And you know, you you might be able to get a photovoltaic system on your on your roof that may handle 10, 15, maybe 20% of your electric power but you're going to spend a couple hundred grand for that. So it's going to be one of those things you have to kind of weigh that against how much your electricity costs are and what the payback period is for that. Um, especially if you're talking about being, uh, and those percentages are based on you being an electric, all electric building rather than burning fossil fuels. An all electric building is very green, um, but it costs more to heat and cool your building. I mean, uh, electric resistance heat, just cost more than than gas or or oil um so it's it, it it's green it, um and that's that's the way everything is is leading is headed but um but but it it does have a significant impact in terms of how much how much you're going to pay and so uh having uh you know, if you had if you had gas heat in your building, then you know the same size array might might provide twenty five percent of your power, because you're not you know you're not electric heat. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions for Phil at this point? You too, Sue. <laughs> Okay, so I guess unless there's anything else you want to say, Phil, about um, the project schedule. Uh, no, as I said, it, it, like everything else, like the like your project budget is a kind of a living document, and it will it will morph a little bit as we kind of go along and and then get filled in with more detail. Um, it's probably Dan that's going to be maintaining it, um, but he wanted to know what my thoughts were, and so I I prepared this and sent it off to him, and and he does he would like me to try to con condense this a little bit if I can. And, and as I said, once we get into DD, we'll, we'll talk to the, the engineers about whether or not they could, they could cut some time out of here. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So the next thing is um, talking about the temporary library space and, um, <clears throat> and an RFP uh, request for proposals. Is that something you feel comfortable talking about, Phil, or is that something that Dan would take? Uh, Dan will probably help you with that, but um, you are, it's really early for this conversation. Okay. Um, I, I think, unless you have a different idea, that you um, are probably going to want to move out sometime between the end of construction documents uh, during the bidding phase. Some folks like to wait until after the bid phase is over. Um, because if something happens, if there's a little micro spike in the in the economy and bid prices go up or something like that, and and you know you open the bids uh, here in January and it's high, um, and you have to rebid something, or if there's a protest, or some bidder doesn't like what some other bidder did or whatever, and there may be a little slowdown, um, and occasionally things will need to be rebid, uh, and this date may push out a little bit. Uh, so some folks want to want to wait until they have the bid in hand before they move out. Uh, other folks are going to take a chance and they're going to move out, come towards the end of construction documents. Anyway, um, and then, you know, if we ended up, another variable would be if you decided that you were going to do hazardous materials abatement and demolition as a separate contract, for example, and you wanted to do that early, um, you could move out and that contract could go ahead. Uh, and then they would kind of button up the building temporarily and then you would um, open up your general bids and then they would come in and, and the demolition, the hazardous materials work had already be done. Um, but it, those are the kind of things that you'll need to know. But in any case, I don't really see that you'd really need to move out anytime between like October and November of this year. 
And what so about, I guess what I'm, what I'm thinking about is uh, locating, a, uh, finding a space. And, and Dan said about um, something about putting the RFP together soon um, for the, into the community to see, you know, what's, what's available for us. Cause I know that, um, you know, the town doesn't own, have any space that they own that's available. So we'd be relying on commercial um, or um, the private schools to come up with something. So sure. I don't know if that's something that, that you feel comfortable discussing, or I should, I should take that up with Dan, you know. Probably, it probably is a Dan conversation. It, it does seem early to me. I mean, I guess maybe folks that have properties that maybe know that a lease is gonna be up later on in the year and they, they may express some interest. Uh, you wouldn't really be able to sign anybody up this early and because nobody would want to commit to how much the rent would be or the lease would be, I wouldn't think, um, right. 10 months in advance. But uh, you, you, you're getting to the point where you're kind of outside my wheelhouse. The okay. stuff that I'm telling you is based on what I've over here heard committees discussing with their OPMs on past projects. Okay. Uh, the, the point that we might get involved is if you needed to do some renovations inside that building mm. in order to open it. For example, if it wasn't handicapped accessible or if something needed to be done or you needed help laying out your furnishings the best way or whatever. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Candace, I, yeah. I presume that there's, there's two buildings. We need a building to move into for temporary library services and we also need a building to store stuff, right? Yes, yep, mm -hmm. yep. So I think in the RFP, I think that's what, um, I mean, originally that's something that the select board talked to the trustees about a couple of weeks ago. And then when I brought that up to Dan, Dan said that that's something that, you know, he can put together. So, um, so maybe Tim has something to say about that because I see his hand is raised. <clears throat> yeah, I think one of the things that Dan or you are gonna have to figure out is what is the square footage or volume of the space that the active portion of this is gonna be in um because that's maybe you know if we have to go out in the commercial market that's the thing that's going to be harder to you know find the exact right building um so uh and you don't want to go into a building that isn't ada compliant if that's a requirement mm -hmm. so um do you have any sense of how much space you're going to need no because up until now i think that you know in any conversations we've had about it especially with the mblc um it's about like see what's out there and then we'll adapt the library will adapt um to the space that's given that that's you know that's given to us or that we're renting um <clears throat> you know within reason um and so that's not something i've talked to um the mblc about or dan but um maybe i'll send an email tomorrow asking both lauren stara and uh and dan about that about how to calculate that mm -hmm. i think they'd be talking to you about you know, a, a, a popular materials and, and kind of circulating collection that's right. available um, your business through space, for, you know, to support your staff. And then right. if, there's, if there's storage room there, then then sure, great. But otherwise, you'd, you'd be talking about storage for your materials, you know, in another facility, as Judy mentioned. Okay. And one other question, then, uh, Phil, about um, I was at the Municip uh, Massachusetts Municipal Association meeting this this weekend, and I talked with um, the folks at the MBLC desk, one of whom said that she has been seeing that costs are not going up as is projected for, we went from eight to 12. She's saying that a lot of these costs are not going up that drastically. So at what point is it design development where you really develop a new cost estimate or? Yes, at, at the end of DD, we'll do another cost estimate. Because obviously the lower, the better for us in terms of we've committed to, essentially if the library, none of the none of the library comes through with the, the trustees raising money, et cetera, we've committed at this point to like $8.3 million mm -hmm. of borrowing. And that's just not something we wanna go back to the town's folks and say, hey, we got a great deal for you. And so um, uh, earlier in the design phases that we would know the better. And, and I don't know if there's anything you do as a, an architect as you design the building um, 
because obviously if you put something out to bid and you tell people you got $12 million, they're going to find a way to spend it. So is there something in the process where you give us options and we say yes to this and no to that? Sure. That'll be kind of built in as, as we go along. We'll, we have a pretty good sense about what this kind of overall cost of the building is based on the schematic design estimate that we've done. And then kind of we'll be keeping our eye on what other projects come in and come in at that we're working on and that we hear about. Um, and we'll try to stay cognizant as, of that as we go through. And so part of the discussion that we'll have when folks make a, a suggestion about what, what if we did this or that, we will point out whether or not we think that will have a significant cost impact um, on the design uh, as, as we go along. It's just kind of built into what we do um, because one of the one of our responsibilities is to keep it on track budget wise and um, we, we don't want to get to the point where we do a DD cost estimate and then say, well, you know, you, you did add a whole bunch of stuff without having <laughs> told you that as we as we move through that process. It's certainly a lot easier to stay on track as we go than to get to a point where you're doing a cost estimate and then to try to pull stuff out. Um, when we get down towards the end, when we get that 75% construction documents estimate in, one of the things that we'll probably look at is what things could become alternates. So you'll have the base bid, which would take care of the kind of basics that you need. Um, and then they might be add alternates for some other stuff that um, we would be able to tell from the cost estimate about how much they're worth. And we might be able to do some substitutions, for example. Um, so some things that we've done in the past are somebody wants a new slate roof. Gee, that's great, but it costs a fortune, right? And so we'll call for the base bid would be an asphalt shingle roof, and then you'd get an ad alternate for the slate. And then you could look at that number on bid day. And when we open up the bids, you'll you'll see that alternate number four costs an extra $250,000. Uh, <laughs> And, and most folks will probably vote no, because uh, you probably won't be able to afford it. But um, so we'll have those conversations as well about what, 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 what we could put into an alternate. Some things make good alternates, some things don't make good alternates. We'll, we'll get to that thing uh, as well. Changing out the two different types of shingles is really not such a big, big deal. But if you decided, for example, like a generator, a lot of people think that a, a generator would be a great alternate and in, in it, in it's not because of the way that it ties in to the electrical system. Um, and so an emergency electrical system is completely different than a building that doesn't have a generator because there needs to be battery backup for emergency lighting and so forth. And you wouldn't have battery backup with the emergency lighting and with generator with your generator, which your generator also comes emergency power panels and automatic transfer switch and rooms for those to go in that need to be fire rated. And, and it really is kind of a completely different design. And when you when you put things that are really complicated like that, it complicates the design. It leaves room for holes and for mistakes, frankly, and uh, it's difficult for contractors to bid. And so you'll get numbers that are all over the place because it's just too hard to figure out what's in and what's out. So we'll have that conversation when we get to alternates down toward the end of construction documents. I know I feel like I'm throwing a lot at you in your first meeting. That's okay. <laughs> Maybe you'll remember some of these things uh, in the months <laughs> coming uh, if we get to them. Okay, so uh, the next thing on the agenda is the contract updates for you, Phil and Dan. And I think I'm guessing the two of you will each generate a contract. I asked Dan if he would like me to generate a contract, kind of a, a industry standard contract. And he told me that he thought um, your town manager, is it Casey? Yes. Uh, had a contract that she wanted to use. Oh. And so that's what I, anyway, Dan told me not to, not to produce a contract. I'm happy to do it. We typically would use the AIA contract and then we have a rider on there that basically takes the AIA contract and aligns it with public work and public bidding rules. Um, okay. It's pretty standard. Uh, and it's one of those things that has kind of been through numerous uh, town councils for a bunch of different towns. And so 
um, it, it, it works for public work. If that's something that you'd like us to put together, we can, but lots of, lots of towns will have their own kind of standard contract they want to use that's written by their own lawyers. That was the impression that I had from Dan. So I, I put together a fee proposal for Dan. Um, it's kind of still in the draft phase. I need a couple of hard numbers from my engineers, but I have calculated what I think those numbers should be. <laughs> So that when they send me a proposal, I have an idea about whether or not they're high or low. Um, and it's pretty close to what Dan carried in the in in the budget. So I think we're pretty close. I just need to get those final numbers from them. But we're but we're pretty close. And I assume that he's he's put one together for you or is in the process. Okay, great. And I think that um if you're if you're okay um to stop sharing your screen dan i mean uh, phil sure um, sorry see each other better yay um let's see okay invoice process discussion this is kind of i added that into the agenda because um i wasn't sure and i've been in conversation with the town accountant brenda hill about um processing the invoices and she wants them to go like how I process all the library invoices to go through me to her. So she and I will both be tracking them. And um, I think that I mentioned that to Dan, I think Dan was a part of this email with Brenda and I, that he didn't think too many invoices would be coming in until you get to like furnishings and, and such. Is that right. true? Yes. And until we, until we get a little further out in to the construction documents phase for the next six, eight, 10 months or so, it's really just going to be, I would think invoices from Dan and I, and, and typically you'd want Dan to approve my invoice. Um, so normally what we'd end up doing is I would send my invoice to Dan and then usually somebody on the, on the committee, like the chair. Um, so I'd send it to Dan and copy it to set two in this case is what I would normally do. And then that way it, you know, once a month or so, uh, Dan would present his invoice and my invoice and then anything else that might be out there, you know, he may, they may be other little things that come in, you know, hazardous materials or, or we need to dig a test pit or whatever. So it could be our invoices and then occasionally there might be a, something else small that comes in. Okay. Great. And then Thank he'd you. make a recommendation. I, folks don't typically ask me to approve Dan's. <laughs> I, I don't think you'd want me to. I think that's what he's for. <laughs> Great. Um, something that came up in the last week after we um, set this agenda was um, adding people from different committees in the town to this building committee. Um, because I, I think there's a, uh, a few people expressed desire from say like the planning board. I know that's one of them. I forget what the other one was. And, um, and I think one of the trustees uh, brought this up, um, not someone who's here present in the meeting. And, um, and I told him that I would check with you, Phil and Dan, because Dan seemed really um, to, to stress that we wanna keep the, the um, amount of people on this committee, you know, you know at, a, at a good low number, like you know, not, not to go beyond six or maybe seven at the highest. And, um, and what to say to these people who are interested in being on the committee from from these from these other committees that Dan did not suggest. He he really suggested trustees, finance committee, and select board. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you feel comfortable addressing, Phil? Well, I I can tell you from from my point of view, um, that seems like a good cross section to me. Um, I would say an odd number is always good in case you're voting. You want to be able to break a tie, um, and so I'd say. If, either five or seven is a, is a great number. I, I've worked on building committees that have been as big as 13 and 15. Um, it's hard to get things done. It's sometimes hard to get, especially later in the project, it's hard to get a, a quorum. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't necessarily think it's a, a super idea. Um, all of the all the building committee meetings are public. Um, yeah. Right, and so those folks could certainly come to the meetings, and especially they could they could because they're not members, they could take a look at the agenda ahead of time and kind of come when 
you're you're going to be talking about things that they are interested in, um, right. and that seems to make sense to me. I that's all the advice I could give. I certainly I wouldn't I I, I certainly wouldn't want you to take from that 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 I don't that I'm saying no to additional right. members. Um, the only advice I'd give is if, if there's going to be additional members, I would do it pretty quickly. Um, right. Occasionally, I've, I've I've worked on a project where you know we're three quarters of the way through the design, and and two new members come along, and they and, and they don't like where you're at, and they want to go back. Uh, and mm -hmm. nothing kills a project schedule like going backwards. Right. So maybe would you suggest that I just run this by Dan as well, since he wasn't here tonight? Yeah, just I get think his you, you recommendation. Get, get his opinion. Um, you know, I. I'm sure nobody wants to hurt anybody's feelings, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you get you get a building to build and it's up to you all to, to decide okay. what's best for you. Okay. And if, if push comes to shove, I'd, I'd say, put it to a vote at one of your meetings and then, and then you can say, hey, listen, we had a vote, didn't go your way. Uh, we're gonna keep it at five <laughs> or seven or whatever it is. Let me ask Julie a question. Um, I get a sense, and I'm sort of trying to verify my sense from the CCI meeting that if, for instance, a planning board member were just to attend the meetings, that that might solve, uh, they don't necessarily want to be a voting member. Is that your thought, or did you think they wanted to actually be voting? I didn't hear the beginning of that discussion, so I, I don't have a solid Because my feeling is like if a planning board member is, well, maybe it's complicating. It's similar to me but being a select board member. So, um, but I think their concern is just to be kept aware of the process as it moves forward. So yeah. that anything that the planning board, there's some language in our bylaws that's sort of vague about when that's a planning board need to be made aware of anything that's happening in town. Um, so I, th I think that just participate participation might be adequate, but um, let's see what Dan says. And I do agree that smaller committees tend to work more expeditiously. Yeah, and agendas, as, as Phil said, agendas will be posted ahead of time and the meetings are public and and we would even invite members if we think it's issues pertaining to them coming up. Like I think one of the other people that was interested was in the energy committee energy, maybe. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. and I'm sure we're not gonna talk about that every meeting, you know, so. Right. Um, yeah, I think that's a good, mm -hmm. good, good insight to Satu, and just the fact of inviting them, I think, might go away toward making everyone feel yeah. comfortable. Yeah. Okay. And if Candace is ex officio, then we're at five right now, right? Well, apparently that's a little bit up for debate, but I think that probably I am a member because I live in the town. I think you are a member. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, I think Dan just, clarified that at the last meeting. Yeah. Where we do have Eva. So yeah. we're, at, yeah. we're at one, two, three, four. Seven. We're at seven. Sounds so. like a good committee to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, that is all I've had right now, other than scheduling the next meeting. Does anyone else have any questions or? I, I got a little bit of new business. Oh, good. Um, if that's okay. Uh, yes. Two things. Um, one is about the it's the design that I mentioned early on. And the in the second is that uh, Dan and I talked, and we wanted to recommend um, if you if this group and or your staff uh, if you wanted help making arrangements to get a tour of Greenfield Library mm -hmm. under construction. Yes, um, that'd be great. I think it's gonna it's gonna help a lot to kind of see the a little bit more of the nuts and bolts um, of kind of what's going on. And so when we're when we're kind of talking about these things, um, folks that don't do this every day like Dan and I do, uh, and like Vern does, um, we'll we'll have a better idea about what we're talking about. Um, yeah, that'd be great. And and you'll see things there and and. Um, that you may not have kind of noticed the first time around you went on tours and so forth. And I typically would recommend if, if, if folks lots of times at the beginning of a project will go tour other libraries 
Um, and I think that's a great idea if anybody who's interested in doing that um, to do it on their own or as a group. Um, but to think about rather than going to see 20 libraries in the next couple of months to maybe go see a couple of them and then go see a few more like when we're in schematic design and then maybe in design development uh, and then when you're doing your furnishing selections, which is kind of part way through, because you'll see different things when you're thinking about different things. Uh, and that you may you could visit the same building three times and and with a different thing in mind, and you'll you'll notice different things and you'll ask different questions. And so I'd kind of think keep that in mind. And this is I'm I'm suggesting we kind of kick that off, but maybe thinking about going to Greenfield. Now you could make arrangements with Ellen Boyer yourself or. Uh, Dan and I could meet you there. I'm there every other Tuesday for a job meeting. We could do it then uh, during the day, or um, it's going to need to be during the day. Um, I apologize to folks that work, but um, you know the construction site shuts down at 2.33 o'clock in the afternoon. So every other Tuesday. So when's the next Tuesday you'll be there? Uh, I'll be next Tuesday. Yeah. The 31st? That's, I think that's right. Let me, I closed a bunch of things down to speed my machine up here so um phil what how far what stage is the greenfield library at when when is their projected completion date um they because their their projection completed date is uh, substantial completion is going to be kind of in march beginning of april um they're pretty much on schedule but a couple of things have kind of lagged behind the rooftop unit um from mechanical rooftop unit was ordered, you know, a year ago it hasn't showed up yet. They've pushed the date back a couple of times. The electric switch gear has been pushed back a couple of times, and some of the light fixtures have been pushed back a couple of times. Um, and so, if you were to go in there right now, the second floor has a lot of the ceilings are in place, but you can still see above the ceilings in some places. There's some carpet on some of the floors on the second floor but the main space doesn't have carpet yet. They're putting the main stairway in right now. Um, that's only, that's probably 15, 20% complete. Downstairs, ceiling grids are just starting to go in. There's no carpet down there. They're still building things. Uh, the finished carpenters are putting in some of the casework and paneling in there. So it's still a okay. working, work in progress. Um, okay. One coat of paving is down in the parking lot and they're starting to do some of the sidewalks and curbing. They'll get as much of that done based on the weather as they can. Mm. Then they'll end up coming back in the spring after they're mostly done and doing things like landscaping and so forth while the building, while the library is moving in. They'll be still puttering around, wrapping some of that stuff up. Great. So are you, um, do you want to, do you guys want to meet next Tuesday? I will have to confirm that with them uh, rather than spring it on them and surprise everyone. <laughs> uh, but I will try to I'll try to do that tomorrow and then uh, let you know if that works. Okay, I think that'd be great. Yeah, oh, that'd be fun. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, and then the other thing was about the about the plan um, for our next meeting. Would you like me to proceed based on the, some of the discussions we had prior to this committee being formed um, with looking at redesigning the floor plan of the building and sliding it away from those trees in the back. Is that what you would like me to do? Sure. Yeah. I know you provided a really, really rough, very, <laughs> really, very really rough. official um, thing just to, to show us that it could be done. But yeah, that, I think that would be great to see. Okay. And if I could just um, suggest that one parameter I would like to see is for you to attempt to keep the library stuff within the library parcel. Yep. Um, because when I took apart your building, I assumed they were scale drawings and I turned it around to the side. It, it appeared to me that it would be just barely touching the, the parking lot closest to your original design, the, the extent of the building. So it looks to me like it's possible that it can all fit on there, um, but um, maybe it won't be as beautiful as what you were suggesting. And it was your first oh, no, random it'll, thought. It'll, no matter what we do, it's going to be beautiful. That's <laughs> right. Exactly. And it's going to last 100 years. And, yes. Uh, right. Exactly. I, I won't show you anything unless it's beautiful. 
or has the potential to be. But I, I will take a look at that. We, as Candace mentioned, we did a real quickie sketch where we kind of laid out over the over the plan what the footprint of the addition is, holding it back on the backside in order to stay away from that tree. And you know, we can't just stay away from the bowl. We have to stay away from the drip line. Right. Um, so that there's enough room for a machine to move around the building and build it without killing that tree. So it's a fair amount of space that we need. Um, and it does kind of squish the building off to one side or the other in order to get that to happen. And the trees are up. healthy? Pardon? The trees are healthy? They looked okay to me when I was there, but I'm not a tree doctor. I don't know <laughs> if the town has I would it. have them have somebody who knows something look at them. If you're going to change the design of the building that's going to last 150 years for a tree that's going to last 25. It's not a bad idea. We know, yeah, Maori, Sabina's husband is a tree guy. Um, we could ask him to come take a quick look. You, you may have a tree warden in town. Um, or a tree warden. Okay. And I think we do. I think that's a great idea. Bill, I, I remember, mean, it just go ahead. Sorry. I, I remember before when we were talking about this tree, um, the idea came up that if if we took one of the trees down, the one that was closest, and we were able to take it to a lumber yard that could mill it and then actually make some furniture out of the tree, um, that that might satisfy people's desire to um acknowledge this tree's presence in our life mm -hmm. um, and it would also it might save you three months of time in terms of of the development if you didn't have to figure out a way to redo everything to to protect that tree so i i, I, I just remembering that that was a discussion that we'd had before and sure um, i i do kind of recall that discussion now having a tree milled and then having that wood used by a public bid contractor to build something would be difficult to have done because of the public bid rules. So I may have suggested that that could be done, but what you'd probably need is somebody to either volunteer to do that or to have some separate pot of money paid to have an artisan or a, or a cabinet maker or a furniture builder Correct. do that for you. Yeah. Um, and of course, first thing you'd need is, is for the community or whoever it needs to be to kind of buy into having that tree cut down because if that's something you want to do it's going to take a little while to dry that lumber out and you probably need to cut it down sooner rather than later if you want to have something made and the other thing that was in addition to the tree the other thing that was driving it was um, an interest in getting the building oriented so that you could if you did want to include solar you could do it um, the way it looked like it didn't look like that was an option in the in the uh although they put solar panels on non-south facing roofs and stuff um, and it does provide electricity but not as effectively sure right and of course if we do swing it around to the side there is the big tree that's at the front of the library that yeah. also comes into consideration so <laughs> yeah that that looks like it could stay but it certainly would be something to consider sure yeah, by moving it around to the side, uh, uh, yeah, there's going to be at some point it's going to get in the way of the contractor with an aerial lift somewhere, you know, and they'll they'll be asking if they can cut a couple of branches off or whatever. Um, but we're going to try to keep it back behind the building, and that is for the most part up in the front. So we'll, we'll probably be okay with that tree. I have a, a question slash comment for both um, Tim and Julie. Because back in the summer, we had Phil come and Lauren to talk to us about, um, you know, some questions that the the, um, the CCI group had about the design of the building. Um, and I thought that one of the reasons of moving the addition to the side, because there was a desire in the campus plan to have the back of the library be a part of like a, um, a courtyard for the campus. Or a gathering space, or so I don't remember exactly what the term was, but it seemed like I remember Denise talking about that and it being and feeling like that was really something that the the, the campus um, plan call, was calling for. Is that still true? Do you think? There's a field think, back there behind um, bushes, right? We'll let Julie um, chime in on this too, but I think Lily is interested in a center looking like instead of the the North Main Street side of the buildings being, she wants to have something that 
looks at the the space in between all the buildings as as a campus. I don't know that that's um, a strong feeling of CCI in general. Um, and there was also discussion about shared parking. So I think that might have informed what you did, Phil, when you tried a rough sketch of what if we moved it to the side. Sure. So, you know, hopefully all of these buildings uh, will come into focus and we can actually figure out what they're going to be used for other than the 1888 building, um, because that really is a complicating factor for the library. Mm. I also think one thing that came up in that discussion was the possibility of some sort of connection between the library building and the church building. And um, I think that idea has kind of, we don't need to worry about that anymore. Okay. That piece at least has gone away. So really that seems like the biggest question about that is the trees, about the addition is the trees. And the solar. And the solar, okay. Great, thank you. So Phil, um, would you would you say that it's a, uh, would you agree it's a good idea to have a, the tree warden or some someone with knowledge of trees to come before you go back to the drawing board on the addition? I think that makes sense. Okay. Great. And just so I'm clear, the original drawings that if you if you're looking at the front of the library. We're talking about the tree that's on the right rear, right? The one that would come down. Yeah, where the, the where one the that's tables are around. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have the plan right here. I could show it to you, but yeah. It's kind You'd of be surprised awkward. how many people in town have said to me in the last year, "If you, if you um, take that tree down, I don't support the project. Or I won't vote for the. I won't vote yes." Or da da da. And uh, it's a really people are really. It's a much beloved tree so um yeah so the, the one we were contemplating taking down is obviously the one that's closer to the building it's probably a 12 inch maple but it sits out in the lawn and it's got a nice symmetrical looking canopy and i've seen people sitting under it and the other one that's closer to the field and uh the bushes that are back there is is significantly larger i don't know what type of tree it is um and that's also a handsome tree and that's the one we were trying to preserve but we've heard that folks like both of them. Um, <laughs> so that we'll, we'll do what we have to do. Okay. Great. Um, we, we did a library back, this is when I used to work for Tape Associates, the, the library sat in a, in what was basically a public park and there was a number of specimen trees that had been planted there over the years. Um, <laughs> I didn't work on the project myself, but they ended up designing a, a building that was almost like a Z shape <laughs> to work around a couple of these trees. Uh, wow. Not, not very efficient. No. <laughs> but it could be done. So I'm going to share something uh, if you just. So um, the tree that we're talking about is over in this side, right? Yes. Where my cursor? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I have one question, or maybe it's an item for the next meeting's agenda, is the process of um, working with the MBLC, um, like the reporting and whatever has to happen for that. That might be next meeting, but. Well, um, they need a report once a month. Um, yeah, that's already begun. Um, we, I, I asked for the. Um, they walked me through as soon as the contract were signed by all the parties um, a couple of weeks ago. I there's this a, a program that we're using called Amplifund. Um, it, it's kind of new for them, but it's much more efficient. Everything happens in one place, including the reports. And so I requested the first payment, which just got approved today, um, which meant which hopefully means it's being deposited. And I'll, I checked with Brenda, and then I'll, I will do a monthly report. Um, End of February, I'll, I'll start that. Okay, so you've got it under control and we don't need to talk about it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'll stay out of it. Don't be asking any other questions. Yeah, it is one of, it's one of those things that usually happens offline. Right. Committees don't normally 
talk about it. Um, and then from, from our point of view, um, they'll want to see what we're doing regularly so that when we get this schematic design kind of figured out and when we're talking to the staff and thinking about showing it to the public, uh, you know, you're getting close uh, to kind of wrapping up what it might look like. They're going to want to look at it then and give you some feedback on what it looks like. And then we'll come back and tell you their feedback and, and how we've kind of incorporated the changes they suggested into the plan. Um, and then they're going to want to see it at the end of schematic design. They'll probably want to see it again in the middle of design development and then at the end of design development and then partway through working drawings and again at the end of working drawings. Um, we're used to working with them and you know we do lots and lots of libraries but they they do all of them so we have really good advice and, but you know every now and then they'll suggest something that is a little bit funny or whatever and you may decide you know i don't i don't really want to do that um that may be one of those things you might that you need to talk about but i had one group one time say we really don't want a staff toilet and the mblc really suggests that you have one and they said we don't we don't want one so we recommend you put one in and they said we're not doing it and i just get stuck in the middle right i <laughs> i signed the contract with the town right but uh, like, uh, the mblc is kind of my client too right because they're helping to pay the bills but really through you so i you know i, I occasionally or rarely will have to kind of throw up my hands and say hey listen i'm going to do what the committee told me <laughs> but that's it's rare typically it's all works out fine Is there a typical ceiling height in libraries? Is ten feet um, something, or eleven feet, or we? Uh, well, it really depends on the size of the space. A larger space really wants to have a higher ceiling so that it doesn't feel kind of cramped. Um, so you know, you might have eight feet in the toilets, or um, right, and and then go larger in some of the other spaces. Um, we've got an existing floor to floor height we have to deal with. And so that's part of the reason that the floor plate stepped a little bit in your, in the other design. Um, so it's, you know, we're trying to, the floor to floor heights in your existing building. Well, I mean, there's a couple of different floor heights downstairs actually, but the kind of general floor to floor height is a little bit too tight um, for us to, we can't really fit all that stuff in there the way they just didn't have the kind of mechanical systems and steel systems and so forth that we have that take up a lot of room. Um, so something's gonna give a little bit. Um, so, we'll, you know, we'll try to, we typically would try to concentrate some higher spaces in some of this, some of the rooms where it really pays off. Um, so part of the reason for stepping up the, the floor plate um, partway through the upper floor was to give you a little bit more space in the ceilings down below on the lower floor where you have a large children's room and a meeting room mm -hmm. and you get these big large spaces and you don't really want to put a seven foot six ceiling in there it feels like a trip to the bowling alley you know it's not or some other really wide but low space it's just not nice yeah i know i typically like higher ceilings just because i don't like to feel confined but um obviously room size major component and that's sure. yep i was just curious thank you sure okay well we're getting to the um towards the end of the agenda the the next thing to do is to schedule a next meeting um it seems like this was a time that worked as far as within the period of time that works for dan and phil that this works for everyone i know that julie um, uh, if she stays on the committee, five o'clock would be better. Is five o'clock okay with everyone here? Um, I, I just need to sign off around six. Okay. So if we start at five, then I just have an hour. If we started at 4.30, I'd have, depends on how long we expect these meetings to go. I think Dan said about two hours, um, uh -huh. I think. Well, then maybe switch out to the person I have to meet with and see if we can shove that meeting half hour earlier. Okay. Okay. So I guess you guys, um, you can get back to us, Julie. Okay. Great. So I guess we'll this time, uh, four thirty for now. Going forward, four thirty on Tuesdays um, seems to work. Um, and see what what Julie can do. 
Um, and then the other question I have is meeting on Zoom via in person, because I know that meeting via Zoom is very convenient, especially for those like Phil uh, and Dan that, that um, live at a distance. Are there times, Phil, that you would prefer to meet in person when you're going over certain things? Oh, definitely when we get to the point where we need to pick out materials and colors and, you know, we can, we can kind of narrow it down a little bit when it comes to colors, um, <clears throat> just because there's a million of them. Um, and, but when we get to the point where we need to really make a decision, we're going to want to look at physical samples. And, uh, and it's not uncommon for, for folks to meet in person and to kind of look at it and be kind of undecided. And so lots of times we'll leave them with you and let you kind of <laughs> think about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, until the next meeting. So we try to plan that into the schedule a little bit. Uh, and then Phil, you were gonna check about next week to see if Greenfield might work. Yes. A, a tour, okay. Yeah. So I'll have to check on with those folks when they're when they're working. So I'll check with them tomorrow and then send, send you folks a note. Okay. And then Candace, we can check with Dan about when he thinks we should meet again, when there's more enough, you know, things to talk about. I yeah, think he said he wanted to meet every two weeks for it. Um, yeah, but we want to make sure we have, yeah, we'll talk to him, you know. I mean, I don't want to, we don't want to take people's time if there's not things that we need to meet about, so. Because I will tell you, uh, two weeks from right now, I'm, I'll be on a plane flying to Florida. Yeah. <laughs> so we could think about meeting in Greenfield in a week and then two weeks. Well, are you, how long are you going for, Phil? Oh, a, a week. So a week, okay. I, um, I'll be gone. The following Tuesday is Valentine's Day, and I come back on Wednesday night, so I'm I'm available Thursday and Friday. So we could try something that week, maybe. So yeah. I'll be, I'm going midweek to midweek because the the flights are cheap when you do that. They are. <laughs> so I'm gonna see my brother and his family. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, so we will have to be flexible about times. Um, obviously, for you and for Dan. Yeah, I assume eventually we'll get to, into a rhythm, a groove. a groove. Yeah, yeah. Especially if we're going to be meeting twice a month, and then when we meet once a month, I bet we'll, we could have even more flexibility. Yeah. Yeah, so, lots of folks will end up picking a day, you know, like the first Monday or the second Monday of the month, right? So to kind of line up with the billing cycles. Yeah. Right. So I guess then for now we're not going to set a meeting for the next meeting until we talk to Dan. Well, we could like look at that week since we know Phil's gone um, and we'd like to probably meet that week when Phil gets back, I would think, because that would be a long time without a meeting otherwise. And so what week is that again? That's be Thursday, February 6th, 16th. I can't, I have an event on the 15th, so you're going to be gone. The 16th, I work till seven. I would have to look at the following Tuesday. 24th. The 24th Tuesday's the 21st yeah that works for me oh, I'm in January sorry okay. <laughs> <laughs> going back in time um 21st that works yeah that works for me okay. 4 30 we'll stick with for now Julie is that all right yep so when are you leaving Phil and when you're returning on the 15th but you're leaving yeah let me uh get back to that week sorry <clears throat> so I, I fly out on Tuesday the 7th at night, so I'm, I'm around during the day, um, but, you know, I'm leaving here to go to the airport at like 4.35. Yeah, so uh, if, Dan, if Dan wants to meet the 7th, then we could... You could, yeah, you, we could sure, yeah. switch off and you could meet without yeah. me. Um, and then <laughs> I come back, I come back the evening of Wednesday the 15th, okay. so I'd be um, available all day Thursday, Friday. Well, if we met with Dan on the 7th and we did the 21st, that would be a two-week gap. And mm -hmm. there, are, I'm sure there's things that Dan wants to share with the committee that don't necessarily need Phil to be here. It might be a good use of time to, but that's just, you know. Yeah, I think that sounds fine to me. He may have, he may have made some headway with the contracts. I'm, I may have my, mm -hmm. my fee proposal in his hands prior to that. Um, you may you may have heard back from the tree warden before then. Yeah, let's put that. Let me know about those things. Great. Okay. Well, let's put that on the calendar too. Then the seventh. Okay. 
And I'll, There's uh, a finance committee meeting starting at 5.30 that night, but I could go from, I guess, 4 to 5.30. Okay. okay, great. <clears throat> Motion to adjourn. <laughs> I move we adjourn. I do too. <laughs> great. <I'll have> <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. That was great. 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 Great.